Welcome to the Gospel Attic Podcast. I'm Greg Bryan. And I'm Jim Resty. We're gospel addicts because we believe the gospel of Jesus isn't just good news, it's the best news ever. We're addicted to the gospel because it doesn't just start us out in the Christian life, it is the Christian life. Join us as we look at the Bible through the lens of the gospel. Thanks so much for listening. Jim, what do you think the rewards are? Well, that's that you were starting to go there and I, I held you back. Right? Cause I, I think you do have to talk about that because like, well, these verses are here. Yeah, right? they do. The Bible does talk about rewards there. So what so what does it mean? Right. What could it mean? And so and you you were going there a second ago. So uh, why, why don't you, you start on this and I'll pick up on it because you gave a great teaching on this in our study not too long ago. Talk about the kind of rewards. Well, let's talk about what we what what are some of the, some of those guys that you were reading that you c- kind of you know raise the hair in the back of your neck. What 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 do they say the rewards are? Well, that's the funny thing. You read all these commentators, and they all get like I said, super excited about all the rewards. Oh yes, for people like me that have fought the good fight and you know living Christian lives, it's super motivational. I'm so excited about this, talking about it. And then they get to the commentators and say, well, what are the rewards actually? What actually? What form do the rewards take? And they really start to sputter and get like, well, we don't really know because the Bible doesn't really say. I told you there was one I read that said there'd be multi levels in heaven. There's been a couple like that. There'll be higher, we'll get higher levels of heaven somehow, whatever that means. Others say it'll be something that brings you great joy. Who knows what it is? Maybe that's a red Corvette. Maybe that's like a, to repeat that joke. Maybe it's a bigger mansion, you know, but it'll be some personal individual reward some treasure given to you and they something quote, measure, measure measurable Lord. like like a bigger house or a... uh, right something up, but if they if they they immediately assume they don't know what it is but they assume it's a personal reward for you and they use that verse in revelation you mentioned earlier when jesus says no no you didn't mention it. you talked about the great white throne judgment another verse in revelation says jesus jesus says i'm coming soon and my reward is with me and they say see there it is he's it's like santa with a bag of treasure and he's going to come and dole out bars of gold nice who knows what sports cars watches um diamonds who knows what they're going to be and i'll but all the commentators sputter when they get to that i say we really don't know but what we do know it's going to be great and it's and they but they but it's definitely they definitely interpret it as a personal individual like reward for you for all the good work you did and these teachers these teachers emphasize that rewards are a motivation for us right and right. that's where that's where like we say the primary motivation for the christian life is gratitude yes and it's that's gratitude right. for something that was done for us that was that we could never do for ourselves it was the thing that you mentioned is we spend our whole lives trying to grasp um, how 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 wide and how deep is the love of Christ that He did what He did for us on right. the cross, right? Um, substituting right. Himself for us, and um, and that, that 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 is the you know so gratitude for what christ has done is the primary motivation for the christian life not getting rewards in heaven right if we if we it's my position that if we make rewards a primary motivation for your spiritual life that's a dangerous place to be and i think you're falling back into performance driven pride driven christianity and so, um, well, so I don't, you know, I think that it's fair to say that nobody does really know what the rewards are going to be. <laughs> but there's a couple of verses that we've talked about that help us get a clue for what they are. And there are two verses that talk about crowns. Yeah. I, th- I think you mentioned them. I got them in front of me. You want me to read them? Yeah, you read them. Yeah. Okay. One is Philippians four, verse one. And this is Paul writing. He says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in this way, dear friends. That was Philippians 4, verse 1. And the other verse that's really clear on this is 1 Thessalonians 2, 19. 
It says, for what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? 1 Thessalonians 2.19. So what are, the, what, are the, what are the rewards? What could they possibly be? What are the crowns? Yeah, so this is where I think that you and I land when it comes to this idea of rewards. And, you know, we're willing to be proven otherwise, but... I think the scripture's teaching that the rewards are the lives that have been impacted, um, touched by um by us. Um, but it's not um it's because we of that gratitude, that's that's what makes me want to live for Jesus. That's right. And when I live for Jesus, I'm going to do good works. I'm going to touch other people's lives and it's not, I'm not doing it out of pride. Um, but, you know, I was thinking about this, you know, I was thinking about three different areas where at that judgment seat of Christ, um, we might come into like a full realization of um, the impact our lives had on earth. One is just our direct ministry. Like mm -hmm. people, you know, direct people that we directly impacted. And I would say we're aware of a lot of those. I mean, I know that there are there are people that have written me and, um, you know, have thanked me for the impact I've made on their lives, whether it's sharing the gospel with them, bringing them to faith. So I know and I know those people. I know those people. But I also think that there's people that I've that maybe that I've touched that I don't even realize that I made an impact. I can remember a guy writing me an email years, years after I ministered to him when he was a college student and his email thanked me because at one of our events, I, I gave him a book on prayer mm. and it was like a prize. Um, you know, it was like a random prize. It was like a white elephant gift exchange or something like that. And he got the gift of, he got this book on prayer, I think by John Piper. And he wrote me specifically saying that that book changed his life wow. and put him on the path um, to, um, you know, devoting his life to prayer. Wow. And um, I was like shocked because I didn't even remember I did that. And so I wonder if at the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to see that. But the thing that the, the other two areas that I thought, thought of, that we never really get any glimpse of the impact we have is our giving. Mm -hmm. Like when we give and I don't, you know, I'm pretty sure like you're like me, like you give to lots of different organizations, you give to individuals, you give to the church, all that charitable giving. And um, we have no clue how God is really using that. Right. Like, I think in eternity, I think we're going to see the impact of that giving. And then probably the biggest one is prayer. Because um, I don't know about you, but um, I, I see answers to prayer. But I but I pray for things that I'll never know how those prayers are answered. Like when I pray for different countries, when I pray for different people groups, when I pray for my friends who are... Um, from you know uh, other other religious backgrounds right um you know when you pray for a country mm -hmm. you know um it you know I, I just to me i think the judgment seat of christ my theory and um is that that's where we're going to get a glimpse of the impact that our prayers are giving our direct ministry had on people's lives. And I think it's going to be a time of tremendous joy right. and very humbling too, because we'll realize that, you know, unlike, I mean, there's so many people that do try to measure the impact of their ministry. Like, you know, they're like, you know, we touched, well, even some of the things I shared earlier on this podcast, you know, 88 countries. Well, Right. But still, I have no clue. As if we I got have... credit for that somehow. <laughs> right, right. Um, I mean, that's what I love about doing this podcast is the fact that people can discover discover it. 
um, from all over the all over the globe yeah. and maybe benefit. I mean, this could be life changing, even just, you know, rethinking your idea of rewards right. and what those rewards are. To me, it makes the most sense because there's three things that last forever. God, his word and people. And so it makes sense to me that the rewards would be the lives of the people that we've touched. And the thing is, part of those rewards are going to be the people that touch my life. Like I'm going to get, I'm going to get to thank the people that touch my life and impacted my life. So here's the image, contrast these images. The, the, the passage from the guy you just read thinks he's going to stand in front of the great white throne. God's going to put his scroll of sins behind that. It's very, very, very limited scroll because it's, it's very sin, very, you know, a sinless life. And then they're going to list all the great things he's done. They're going to say, here's a goodie bag, all these individual rewards, because you, many have done, try, but you have you have exceeded them all. And well, he'll, he'll hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So his individual performance will be evaluated. He'll say, he, he thinks it's, it's so motivational because I'm going to do really well at this game. You know, and it's going to be a great day because I'm going to get then this, the, the goodie bag will burst open. I'll have all kinds of indi individual personal rewards for me. Right. That's his image of the judgment seat of Christ. Contrast that with what you just pictured, which is where you say, okay, Greg, it's your turn. Step up to the judgment seat of Christ. And you, and they say, what do you have to say for yourself? You say, Lord, I have nothing to say for myself. My only righteousness comes from you and what you've given me. And I praise your name because all my sins were cast on you and taken off me. Right. And he says, well, Greg, I want you to show something. Everybody else in line, anyone whose life was touched by Greg, come forward, all of you right now. And you think, well, maybe, you know, a dozen, two dozen people come forward. Those are the direct people in your first category. You know that you led to Christ or whatever. And suddenly dozens come, hundreds come, thousands come. You're like, who are these people? And, and every one of them says, Greg, you don't even know. You had you said something to someone and then that person says something and that person gave to a ministry that changed my life. You have no idea how much you touched. All of them step forward. And, they, and, and Jesus says, Greg, turn around, look at your reward. You're going to yeah. spend eternity with all these people. And huge applause and thunderous applause, right? That's the view. And then, by the way, the next person, someone else steps up, and you get to be in their throng, whoever they are, and say, I just want you to know I'm here because of you. And you've changed my life. And you get to be their reward, right? Totally yeah. different. Totally yeah, different. it is. It is a totally different image. And I, I just think that judgment seat of Christ is going to be more about joy. And I'm yeah. not sure, you know, when I was, when you were, talking about that i was thinking i might be on my face yeah <laughs> because not, yeah. i'm in the presence of jesus yeah i'm not sure i'm not sure i'll be standing up with any type of confidence at all i think well, i'll be in in a in a the i'll be worshiping the way i sh i wish i could worship now undistracted it'll be i'll be focused on jesus and you know, like you, you see the sports athletes, they they score a touchdown, then they point up. Yep. Um, all because of him. I, I think you know, even even if what you shared is true, I think I will be very aware. I'll be pointing at Jesus, like that wasn't me. That was that was the good works that God prepared in advance for me to do. Amen. 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 And you and, and you and you say, Lord, I, if your motivation was ever right, you were just doing it for Him, right? So it's yeah. like that guy's world who said, no, 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 this is the way it works. You see, you've got to do these things to get individual performance. What if it doesn't work the way you said? If he, if his motivation falls apart, if he says, oh, well, in that case, why would I ever do anything good? You say, well, who are you doing these good works for? Right? If there's no reward in it for you at all, you should say, I'm only doing it for Jesus. Even, even if there is no reward in it for me personally whatsoever. Right? Um, he should be doing it that way. So the so when we think about that image, there's two passages we really need to talk about that we haven't talked about yet, even in our, you know, talking about this over the weekend, getting ready for the call. One is Matthew 20, where yeah. they all work at different times of the day and they and they get to the judgment and everybody gets the exact same reward. And that is not talking about the people you've influenced or anything. This is like your your personal reward for you personally is exactly equal. It, 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 very quickly in the parable some people show up and work all day. Some people show up at the last hour of the day. They all get the same wage. The people who show up work all day long are angry. And Jesus, Jesus says that the, the, the worker who is God's, the, the higher the uh, owner who is God says, look, it's my money. I can give it to who I please. 
I'm giving it. It's all a gift to all of you, whether you worked all day or whether you got saved in the last five minutes of your life, right? Your, but your personal reward is exactly the same. Now, if you get saved in the last five minutes of your life, you're not influencing a lot of people for Christ, right? So you, you those people will say, I missed out on that. I wish I'd been saved earlier because I got to get a chance to do all that, right? They're the ones who are going to say I missed out, but you won't all get the same personal reward. So that was one passage I wanted to mention. There's one more I want to get to. but I don't, What's I the other one? What's the other one? Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats. How oh, can you talk yeah. about talking to Christ? I'll talk about the sheep and the goats because the sheep, when Jesus says, look, you did all these great things for me. You visited me when I was sick. You you came and came to my rescue. You did all these great things. They say, Lord, when did I do that? Look, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and and helped you? They, don't, they have no awareness of their good deeds at all. In other words, they would say, my entire life was just focused on Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. My my awareness of my goodness was non-existent. I don't, Jesus, I don't know what you're talking about. And Jesus says, you did all these great, these, these things for people. You help people. You do this. When you were doing that to them, you're doing it for me, right? So they, they're going to be they coming to see, let me show you the people you helped. You're, you're rewarded for that. You're recognized for that. But in their life, they say they had no cognizance of it, no focus on it whatsoever just focus on jesus hmm. yeah that's man those are great those are great those are great passages yeah i mean i just i just think that um you know pride is such a huge problem for oh, yeah. people um like you know it's something i think if all of us were honest we struggle with on a daily basis right pride Right. And so it makes no sense at all that we would have any pride before when we stand before Jesus. No, it it's and it's 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 exactly how every other religion works. In fact, the distinctive of our religion is grace. But every other religion says you want to have the pride of being righteous and the shame of being a sinner, right? Of being of not following the rules. And this whole idea throws it right back. In fact, one of the commentators I read said, why should you be surprised if the Christian life works this way? Every religion works this way. And I thought, that's the reason to be surprised. Because <laughs> that is the one right. thing that makes Christianity very, the one thing that makes Christianity different from all the religions is this notion of grace. God is the one who gives you his righteousness, right? And and if you and if what you're saying is true, it's so, to, to build off what you just said, Greg, it's so counterproductive. It just makes you prideful, makes you worse sinner, right? If you if you think you're going to get rewards in heaven, you're filled with pride, more pride than Paul. Yeah, and you're worse sinner than you were when you started. And it it also, I mean, if you think about it, if if you really buy in a hundred percent to this idea that those rewards are what you accomplish, right? Um, in on this side of eternity. If you're not in full-time Christian work, you must feel guilty. Because if, be, what are you doing? You should be in full-time Christian work. Right. Crazy. I mean, like, why not? Like, why wouldn't everybody be in full-time Christian work? Why wouldn't we be, you know, we all just leave America and go to the hardest to reach countries in the world? And absolutely. Should all be missionaries. Were you wasting your time? Right. So I I just yeah, it just doesn't if you if you think about it it just doesn't make sense the the bible the bible talks so much about pride and the, and and right. the danger of pride and this just seems to feed pride this 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 uh way of looking at rewards and if fear. you get it wrong if you and get fear. it wrong and fear like i'm going to miss out i'm going to be the one embarrassed all my sins are going to scroll behind me yeah fear guilt yep. shame which are really uh -huh. great ways to modify behavior if your goal is just to move people up the single line and get them to be just better people. But that's just not Christianity. It's not gospel-driven Christianity. It's not gospel-driven transformation. And it's not going to make you a gospel addict. That's right. So, you know, Paul, the Apostle Paul, talked about it in Galatians. And one of my favorite verses that um, speaks of, like, being a gospel addict is what Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. Yeah. He says, may I never boast. This is the only thing I should boast about. Except I should only boast in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Yeah. He's like, 
the the only thing I should have pride in is yeah. in in the cross. Oh, yeah. And to me, that is what that is what why we're gospel addicts. That is what gospel driven sanctification is all about. Yeah. Is boasting not in ourselves, not in our works. Um, but boasting in the cross. Yeah, that's like in Philippians 3 is like that too, right? Whatever things were gained for me. If anyone could have boasted, I mean, this is the guy who wrote like half the New Testament. Yeah, yeah, right. You Spiritual know. accomplishments, like, oh my gosh, he should be the front of the line. He'd be running to the back of the line. Hey, yeah, I mean, cap this off if you want, if to, with uh, returning back to 2 Corinthians 5, because there's one other thought about this that I thought. Yeah, go for that, it. That's where we started with verse 10 which is this verse about the Bema seat and all these commentators, they say they get to this verse and they light up and say, Ooh, this is where all oh my goodness gets rewarded. That's the one that says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But the verses right before it don't sound like someone who's thinking about appearing before the judgment seat where their whole life's going to get judged. Like the, the way the apostle Paul would have felt about it. Right. But instead what he says, I don't read this. This starts at the second Corinthians five verse six. He says, therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we live by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be at home, away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we at home in the body or away from it. I mean, this is somebody who says, I can, I'm a confident, I can approach the throne of grace with confidence. This is the same one who said, I'm the chief of sinners, right? Same one who said, all my righteousness is filthy rags. He said, I'm really looking forward to being at home with him. I'm not going to recoil in horror at a, at a judgment that looks at my life because I'm really, I, I, I really want to be with him. And he says, my goal is to please the Lord. Now, how, how could he say that? And because the next, very next verse says, you got to appear before the Bema seat. So it doesn't, it doesn't make sense for somebody to say, hey, I'm really looking forward to this day. And then, by the way, judgment for all your works. And the key, no. I think, is this chapter, 2 Corinthians 5, has one of the greatest verses in the gospel in the entire Bible. It ends with that verse. It's 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made, this is Paul says, this, this is one where I've heard like translators translating this, like drop the pens and say, oh my gosh, every verse is great, but this is one that leaps off the page. Say, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. All my sin was put on him. All his righteousness was given to me. That's how I can be confident to approach the throne. Because when God say, looks at me, he's going to say, give, a, give an account for your life. All my sin was put on Jesus. All his righteousness was put on me. That's the only way I can stand before. If, 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 if it's not that, if it has anything to do with you and me, Greg, it's hopeless. It's like every other religion. It's hopeless, right? But that's what gave him the confidence. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Gospel Addict Podcast. Feel free to contact us via email at gospeladdictpodcast at gmail.com. Stay tuned for our next episode. And remember, on your worst days, you're never beyond the reach of God's grace. And on your best days, you're never beyond the need of God's grace. See you next time.